Welcome to BizHack Live, where every Wednesday at 12.30, we talk to some of the top thought leaders in digital marketing. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack, a uh, training program dedicated for helping small businesses. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited today to welcome uh, Alberto Pardo, better known as Banano, um, who's going to be talking today about mobile marketing in Latin America and to U.S. Hispanics. We're going to talk about uh, mobile marketing uh, during this very busy election cycle. We're only a few weeks away and how marketers are targeting U.S. Hispanics in the U.S. in English and in Spanish and also how uh, different countries use and utilize um, mobile in their own home countries and different apps and have different usage patterns. Um, as uh, we often talk about the word Hispanic in, in, in the United States is a government term that really groups together people from many, many different countries, cultures, and with many different habits. Um, and so we're gonna really break that down today with Alberto, really understand uh, how that works and how that can become relevant to you as a marketer if you're looking to either market to US Hispanics or if you're looking to market overseas in the Southern Hemisphere. I'll also add that this is an area of particular uh, interest and expertise of mine because I spent uh, more than 10 years as a foreign correspondent in Latin America, first for the Miami Herald, uh, where I was the correspondent in Argentina of the Southern Cone. Southern Cone includes Chile, Argentina, Bolivia, um, uh, Uruguay, Paraguay. Uh, but also then as the Latin American correspondent for NPR's Marketplace, where I covered the 34 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as U.S. Hispanics. And I remember as a reporter, I would always get these questions about how are Hispanics different? And I struggled, I struggled to answer this question. Um, the one thing I would always say is they love the smell of fabuloso and the smell of lavender. Uh, which was very particular. You know, people love the smell of fabuloso in Latin America, and it seemed like a universal trait. Uh, but I think that we're going to learn a lot more today from Alberto from this question that I always uh, was interested in and wanted to have answers to around usage habits and behaviors. Um, after my career as a journalist, uh, you know, at the, uh, some of the top organizations, I then became a marketer, um, working for a billion dollar energy company two software startups, and now marketing my own company, BizHack, uh, which is a small business training program. Uh, you can see that uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, we primarily were doing in-person classes. I don't know if you can read it, but it now says live via Zoom. So we pivoted like so many other businesses during this pandemic. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about this. The hidden toll of COVID-19 is small business death. Right now we've had more than 200,000 people die and more than 100,000 small businesses die. And that number is going to accelerate. And I bet you we will see a moment with the way things are going when the number of small business death and the number of people death start to match up because there is an acceleration of small business death due to a lack of federal support by both parties uh, of our small business community. Another phenomenon that's happening is women are dropping out of the workforce at a shocking rate. Before the pandemic, the number of women in the workforce roughly equaled men for the first time ever. And now we're seeing, we're going back a decade or more as women who traditionally been in the caretaker role are dropping out of the workforce so that they can take care of children who are being homeschooled or being educated via Zoom. This is a almost universal phenomenon across the United States, and it is a huge step back for women entrepreneurs and women business owners everywhere, as we, uh, those old gender stereotype roles of unequal participation in raising your families is having a big impact on our small businesses. I wanna talk about another idea, which is a core value of BizHacks, which is called radical empathy. Radical empathy is the practice of actively striving to understand the feelings and experiences of others, and through doing this, to improve their lives in a concrete fashion. This is from Isabel Wilkerson's very important book, Cast. And I really believe that our act of radical empathy in the face of small business death and women dropping out of the workforce is our concrete action 
is our scholarship program for women and entrepreneurs of color. We've had more than 300 applicants to date. 35 plus business owners have been recipients of those scholarships with scholarships totaling more than $70,000. We have scholarship recipients who are actually on this call today. I'm very proud of this program. And if you or anyone you know is interested in the scholarship program, you can put try.bizhack.com slash scholarship and apply today. This is a scholarship that goes towards our five week program, which starts November 2nd. And this Friday at 12 noon, I'm gonna be having a information session about the scholarship. I encourage you or anyone you know to join. Uh, Lilia will also put uh, into the chat uh, how you can RSVP for that. And I hope to see you there on Friday. So I just wanted to acknowledge our partners, Safima uh, and the Miami Marketers. Um, actually, I'd love, Andrew, if you could take a second and unmute yourself. You're the incoming president of Safima. We're both board members. Could you just tell folks a little bit about what the South Florida IMA is and what some of the work that we do is? Sure, sure. So in 2019, obviously, uh, we've had to take a step back into a virtual based uh, organization, but uh, FEMA is really kind of a connector of um, brands, agencies, and media companies and small businesses um, in South Florida from, uh, from Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach. Uh, and this, we call it FEMA. Um, and basically every month there's a virtual educational event that we put on uh, in, in partnership um, most of the time with uh, BizHack Academy. And this is just an educational kind of nonprofit uh, where, you know, uh, members can gain access to brands, uh, agencies, and, and case studies across different uh, types of disciplines within the digital world and space. As me coming in from as VP to president next year, uh, we're going to be really having a strong focus on, on Fortune 500 and the bigger regional companies that are based here that weren't member, were members in the, in the long, distant past, but it has kind of uh, been pivoted back to small business, but we're trying to get that um, kind of vision and leadership under my, myself next year with, with larger brands, regional agencies, and uh, top-notch education with CMO breakfast and that type of, of thing. So I look forward to kind of, you know, bringing the vision to light next year. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. It's um, Andrew at adsmobile.com, A-D-S-M-O-V-I-L.com. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Andrew. And Andrew, feel free to put either information about Safima as well as your contact information. Now, I know that we were at one point offering for COVID impacted entrepreneurs um, a, an, uh, an offer. Is that offer still in place? Oops. Uh -oh. Sorry about that. Yes. Uh, so I, I believe it's uh, $49 or I'm sorry, $15 for new members until the end of the year. Uh, pricing is, is most likely will say the same since we're, be, we're virtual and we're not meeting in, in person. So I believe it stays at 15, but I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure exactly, but I, I can have that information back over to you, Dan. Like, Perfect. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm very proud to be a board member of Safima. It's an organization with a long history. In fact, the founder of Safima, Cheryl Cattell, was one of our um, amazing presenters recently. Um, and uh, the other folks uh, who we wanted to thank is our partners, Miami Marketers. Uh, Miami Marketers is a group, uh, it's a networking group of uh, folks in Miami. It's free to join. Uh, you can just uh, find them on Facebook uh, and you can join them there. Um, so before we move on to Alberto, I did want to just, um, guys, give you a little bit of a preview of the amazing stuff that we have coming up over the next couple of weeks uh, in BizHack Live. Um, we have our digital marketers graduation party. Uh, this is the five-week uh, cohort. Uh, they're going to be doing case studies about digital marketing during the era of COVID, uh, with not to be missed this time next week. Uh, the week after that, I'm going to give my signature presentation, The Five Pillars of Digital Campaigns. It's a uh, fabulous presentation, uh, if I may say so myself. Uh, one that I usually charge $50 for, but, um, you know, given uh, what so many small businesses are going through, I'm offering it free to the BizHack community. We're doing this in partnership with the Idea Center at Miami Dade College. Uh, the following week, uh, we're going to have a roundtable with ICABA. Uh, on uh, marketing during the holidays. Uh, the uh, creative there is uh, TBD, um, but we're gonna be include a number of BizHack alumni who are part of the ICABA Black Entrepreneurs Network. 
The week after that, we're going to have uh, the amazing Yvette uh, Grove talking about Can Anybody Hear Me? Getting Heard in an Overcrowded World. This is a presentation that she's given uh, to uh, many folks. She's based out of Texas. I think you're going to really enjoy it. We're going to then talk about the seven keys to exponential marketing, free tools to find your customer online with Emerge Americas. And if you want to sign up for them all, get re automatic reminders, calendar invites, and follow-up emails with bonus. Um, please sign up for our season pass. Uh, Lilia will put that link into the chat. Um, it's only $25, and it, you, think, you should think of it as a contribution towards BizHack so that we keep this BizHack Live webinar series going into 2021. We've had a lot of folks sign up for this uh, as an, a sign of support, and in exchange, you're going to get calendar invites and reminders for all of our upcoming 2020 season uh, of BizHack Live. With that, I wanted to introduce Alberto Banano Pardo, and uh, Alberto... Uh, instead of a formal introduction, I got to ask you, where did Banano come from? Thank you, Dan, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, to be a part of your program, amazing program. Uh, uh, the, my, my nickname comes from, from very, when I, when, when I was a very little kid at school here in Colombia. By the way, I'm here in Bogota, Colombia. Um, and here in Colombia, almost everyone has a nickname. So when I was a little boy at the school, at my, at my uh, primary school, uh, my friends called me Platanito because I used to buy a lot of plantains at the school, I eat a lot of plantains. So they called me Platanito. They, they, you know, it mutated to Bananito and then to Banano. And that's the, the original story of that. Does Banano actually mean anything? Besides no, it's, it's, it's the fruit, just the fruit doesn't mean anything else. It's like the fruit and, you know, I just, you know, I took it like my, my name and actually if you see my email, it's banana, whatever. Yeah. And, no, I and, love you know, it. And actually, yeah, and, and, and I just trademark it and, 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 and use it like my, my commercial name and it works because everybody remembers easier the banana nickname rather than my name. So for me, it's so good. You know, I'm so glad that you're here today, and I want to thank Andrew for introducing us. Uh, Andrew works uh, with, uh, Andrew from Safima works with Banano. Banano is uh, a gifted visionary and entrepreneur. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of AdsMobile, uh, but he has been active um, in the Latin American market uh, with, the, you were a founder of the Camera Colombiana de Comercio Electronico, um, you were a regional manager for De Remate. Um, you had an extraordinary background, um, including an MBA uh, at University of St. Thomas. I'm very excited to talk to you um, both about Latin America marketing, U.S. Hispanic marketing, mobile marketing, and entrepreneurship. Uh, without further ado, Alberto Pardo of AdsMobile. Thank you so much. I'm going to uh, share my screen. I I did a presentation for all of you, and I think thanks for the for the invitation. I have a, a very interesting uh, and very updated presentation about what's going on here in Latin America and the U.S. Hispanic market. Um, I would like to focus more on the opportunities that I see in these markets for all of you. I am assuming you all guys uh, have any kind of business and. And I was telling Dan before we started this presentation today that I really see a huge opportunity now more than ever uh, to start doing business in Latin America. And I'm going to show you why. And the reason for that is that we, we already have all the big companies from the U.S. operating in Latin America from a long time ago. So the opportunity is right now for the small SMB business, small businesses, small entrepreneurs, and, and Latin America is more open than ever uh, to do business, especially with the U.S. And I think uh, for the U.S., Latin America represents the best opportunity in order to, to increase the trade. And of course, for many millions of small businesses that are located in the U.S., Latin America must be a, 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 a target. So I'm going to start. And after that, when we finish, we can start doing the, the, the questions. But I think you guys also can use the chat and write every single question yet that you might, might raise. First of all, 
forgive me for my English. Of course, I'm Colombian. I'm not an American, but I will try to do my best. Uh, anyways, if I make a mistake, please uh, forgive me in advance. So uh, the idea of the presentation is to uh, show you a little bit about what's going on. Uh, I will start to, you know, to to put you in context what's going on today in India. India is and China maybe are the largest uh, or more interesting or more right now the where we see or where everybody talks about the opportunities and and makes sense because India and China they have a lot of population, right? But if you see what's going on today, not only in the attention, what it's on on on, on India, uh, is because at the end of the day, LATAM or or what we call LATAM is Latin America, uh, is still ahead. And GDP, if you see the GDP in Latin America is almost twice as India, which is uh, one of the most important things uh, that you guys need to consider when you enter into a market. And, and these kind of things are not usually what we everybody see, but Latin America has a very big, uh, in compared to India and to compared to China in terms of, of GDP. Uh, if you see, uh, of course, uh, is nearly is nearly uh, half of, of what's going on in, in China, but it's almost perhaps the same in per capita, right? Uh, uh, however, if you see what the reality in Latin America, Brazil is almost the third of our GDP, and this is something that you are going to see in my presentation very, very consistently and repeatedly that Brazil is basically. Uh, the whatever we call uh, Brazil is our China. Let's see, in in a, in another words, uh, uh, Brazil is perhaps the uh, uh, perhaps no, it is the largest economy we have in Latin America, and it's something that for everybody is like Brazil. Oh yeah, soccer, uh, party, you know, beaches, nice place. Uh, it's beautiful, but Brazil is really a very interesting economic uh, opportunity for everyone, even for us in Latin America. And sometimes uh, in the U.S., you guys try to consider uh, Brazil as a, as, a, as a not included in Latin America because of the language. Remember that Brazil uh, is the only country in Latin America, the only country of the 34 countries that we have uh, that are not in in in, in the in the Hispanic uh, or they don't speak Spanish; they speak Portuguese. So it's very important that also Latin America perhaps is one of the youngest populations in the world. Uh, which is very important in terms and very uh, Latin America. It's uh, very young, which represents a, a huge uh, opportunity in compared to Europe, compared to to what's going on in 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 the U.S. and of course in APAC, where the population is is uh, uh, far older than we have. So look, things like uh, by 2020 this year, Latin will have more credit cards owners. Uh, uh, than India, which is very important, uh, and look, compared is almost 10% more maybe in Latin America car owners, and that's credit card owners, and this is a very important uh, milestone or or KPI uh, in order to do business because at the end of the day, it can show you uh, how developed is the financial systems in each of the of the countries, uh, especially when you do digital business, is very important to understand how developed are the financial institutions. It will give you a, a very good opportunity in terms of how fast you can move in terms of e-commerce or maybe other type of businesses that you will need people totally tagged to the financial systems. Or e-commerce, if you see right now, Latin America has more e-commerce or more buyers today than India. Maybe in 10 years it's gonna be different, but today we are talking about today and today Latin America leads over India and leads over China in many of the key facts of key uh, points that we might consider to in order to, to appoint or to, to build a business, right? Uh, uh, mobile payment subscribers, of course, are much higher in Latin America than, than in India and much higher than in other countries. Uh, uh, if you see Latin America has been closing the gap comparing to advanced economies, uh, if you see internet users, Latin America has been growing very, 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 very fast. Of course, uh, when, and if you see, we always put Brazil in front because Brazil is, is the leading country, but uh, uh, we all, we, Latin America have maybe 420 million internet users. If you see, it's almost twice or maybe 1.6 times what you guys have in the US, it's almost 
1.2x times what you what the Europe economies has. So Latin America is going to become is going to become uh, in the maybe in the next 10 years one of the largest internet economies or populations in the world. Uh, just to give you an idea, Latin America. No, no, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. One quick thing. If you could just project a little more your voice, uh, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Sorry. Okay. And how about more? How about now? Better? Yeah, much better. It's 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 more about your voice than about the microphone. Just uh, project. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. perfect. That sounds great. Sorry. So if you see if you, if you if you see something very important here is that Latin America, uh, it's including the Caribbean islands, is like a 720 million people in population, total population, which is a lot, uh, by the way. But if you see internet users, we, we right now maybe have maybe 420 and with the COVID, perhaps we will reach 450 by the end of the year. And mostly these, all these increasing users are coming from mobile users. Actually, if you see the mobile users in Latin America are very big. And this is basically what has been going on in, in Latin America and in some other poor countries that the, the internet economy is purely based on, on mobile connections. So the broadband is coming not from the fixed lines, but it is coming from for the for the cell phones, from the cell phones. So it's very important for Latin America. So we are expecting maybe to grow and to have in the next four or five years almost uh, five five hundred million uh, uh, internet users, which is a, a very big economy if you compare it to the US. Because the US is is more difficult for the US to grow 10 million new internet users than for Latin America to grow 10 more uh, million internet users, same for Europe. So Latin America is gonna become a very, a very, a very important uh, part of the equation in terms of the digital opportunities that we will have here. And this is, by the way, the, the, whole, the whole story of the, of the presentations. And if you see, we already have maybe almost 400 smartphone users, 400 million smartphone users in Latin America, uh, which is larger than the US population, for instance. So we represent a very good opportunity for the digital uh, advertisement business, for the e-commerce, for the banking industry, for the streamers, for the every single company that we like to penetrate uh, uh, and a smartphone business or a business through the apps. Latin America represents a very huge opportunity. Uh, uh, just to give you an example, uh, Facebook has a very big footprint in Latin America, and they also have almost 350 million users, more than the total population, again, from the U.S. And we also uh, have uh, right now a very interesting uh, milestone, which also have almost 400 million bank accounts users in Latin America. So if you see internet and mobile internet penetration is being growing rapidly, especially because of the of the huge impact that the mobile uh, or the smartphones uh, uh, are doing in the market. So everyone is getting connected through the smartphones. By the way, Latin America is perhaps uh, the, 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 the most, uh, 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 the, has the highest penetration of cell phones and, and cell phones per capita in the world. By the, if you see Latin America has more cell phones lines than population. Only cell phones, I'm not talking about smartphones, I'm talking about cell phones which is relatively natural here if you see the penetration of the of the of the cell phones is maybe 110 percent above population and the reason for that is that many people has maybe one two or, two or either three cell phones or companies or everything so in general everyone has more than than one or, or one one cell phone so very important is that uh, uh, latin america as i was telling you in the in terms of the saturation of the online population uh, has or still has a lot of room to grow and it's not the same case in north america it's not the same case in europe it's not the same case in many other parts of the world where we see uh, uh, a very saturated market so latin america represents a very interesting opportunity uh, 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 here in the region by the way brazil is, is if you see is one of the largest countries in in the world uh, is the fourth country in terms of internet users in the world and is going to grow dramatically in the, the next uh, uh, three or four years. So it's going to become, maybe it's going to surpass 
Brazil at some point, and it's going to get very, 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 very hot uh, in terms of the internet economy of what's going on. Another very important thing that you guys need to consider is that the Latin America is also a very uh, young audience in terms of the people that is surfing the, 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 the web or doing digital things. So Latin America uh, perhaps is one of the, of, the, of the youngest populations in the internet. If you see people from zero to 24 is very big. Brazil, by the way, leads the, 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 that part in Latin America, but we have a lot of young people uh, uh, over the internet, which makes very promise to build a business thinking in five, 10 years, because those people are gonna get uh, uh, older and older and older. And at some point they're gonna have a bank account. And at some point they're gonna buy a car. And at some point they're gonna buy a house. And at some point they are gonna uh, uh, have money to, to spend in many things. And, and that's the, the, the whole thing about the, the economy, which is a very, very, very important. Uh, there's another important thing, and, and if you see uh, Latin America users are highly active on the internet, especially on, on, on social media. But if you see in Brazil and in general Latin America, we spend a lot of time uh, in the internet, which makes a, a very attractive country for that. Uh, if you see, of course, uh, mobile connections is still growing and growing and growing, and internet population is becoming uh, more and more uh, uh, bigger. Uh, we already surpass, of course, as I mentioned before, what's going on in North America. And, and if you see uh, the expectations uh, of, of what's going on is, is maybe uh, to reach 70% of total penetration in the next maybe uh, uh, two or three years of uh, 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 broadband connection or internet connection in most of the, of the countries. Uh, however, uh, Latin America is one of the most unequal regions in the world, and, and that's uh, true, and that's something that we have been working, several uh, uh, the governments have been working to try to reverse this, but if you see uh, only Africa uh, maybe leads, leads uh, 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 which leads this horrible <laughs> KPI, uh, is the one that is uh, leading. So, by the way, uh, most of the countries have been improving this uh, inequality in the past year, but what's going on today with the COVID, I think we are going to go back maybe 10 years. Uh, that's, that's horrible, but, but this is the truth. So what's going on here in Latin America is that perhaps Latin America will have uh, the, the highest uh, impact on the economy in the world because of the coronavirus. That's what the, all the analysts, analysts say about Latin America, that we are going to maybe receive the, 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 the hardest shock of the, of the COVID in terms of the economic slowdown. Uh, but on the other hand, they also say, the analysts say that Latin America is going to recover faster than all the other ones. So if you see can what's can going on- for a second, could you just dig in a little bit more what is it specifically about Latin America that's going to make COVID worse there? And then with your permission, um, sure. I have a couple of questions that are being asked. I'd like to pause for a sec and ask those questions and then let you continue if that's okay. Absolutely. Let me, let me get from the, from the beginning. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the questions. Don't worry about that. But my, my, okay. I'll moderate that. But if you could, um, why, why, what is it about Latin America that's going to make COVID worse than like India, which is a, you know, similarly sized economy, similarly unruly population. It's not like a command and control, you know, two, two sets of democracies. Why is Latin America going to be worse? Uh, I mean, is the economic impact where it's going to be worst in Latin America, uh, maybe than India. And this is what is happening really today. I think uh, COVID is going to be worst in terms of, number of people infected, infected, maybe in India at some point. If we don't discover uh, or we, we don't get a really uh, uh, the cure or a vaccine in the next six or eight months, by the way, India is going to surpass even the U.S. In number, maybe it's going to become the, the, the number one country in terms of uh, uh, COVID cases. But the worst part of this is going to happen in Latin America in terms of economic 
uh, uh, crash. And the reason for that is because of the political decisions that have been made uh, in Latin America. You know, I don't know, maybe you guys don't know, but we have total shutdowns or lockdowns from four countries, Argentina, Peru, Colombia, and I'm missing, and, and Chile. We have lockdowns for almost 90 or 100 days. Can you imagine the effect of that in the economy? This is not happening in India. This is not happening in, in the other parts of the world. So if you lock down the whole down economy, you see the biggest impact of or, uh, uh, that is coming from those type of politics of lockdowns, full lockdowns. Uh, I think India, and I believe India is not taking that decision, and that's why I believe India is not, is not going to suffer the same impact in the economy as Latin America. Another quick question, which is, you know, everybody's heart goes out to Venezuela, um, you know, and the tragedy that predated COVID. Could you just say a word about what's happening in Venezuela related to COVID, um, an economy that was already uh, used to be one of the richest in the world, still have the largest oil reserves in the world, and where hunger and severe poverty has become commonplace? Yeah, first of all, uh, if you, Colombia perhaps used to be the, 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 the partner, the commercial partner, the largest commercial partner Venezuela had at some point. And for Colombia, Venezuela was exactly the same. So Colombia and Venezuela, at the end of the day, we are like brothers. And, and first of all, I'm very sad about what's going on there. And, and I just want to make some comments that the, I think the, the current government is, is, is really not telling the truth about the situation in Venezuela. It's horrible what's happening there. And the reason for that is that uh, since they control all the communication channels, it's almost impossible to understand what really go it's going on there. What we have today, what we see, it's a fraction of the reality. Uh, uh, but I am sure that what is happening in Venezuela is, is a very uh, a nightmare. I mean, they are facing a, a horrible situation uh, there's no gasoline for instance so people they don't i mean so if you are if you grow uh, food i mean if, if you are a, I, don't say, I don't know a potato grower you don't have gasoline to transport the potato to the to the supermarkets or to the markets in general so things like that are right now happening today which is almost unbelievable since venezuela used to have or has the largest oil reserves in the world and used to be one of the richest countries, as you mentioned before, in the world, before the 80s. I mean, so it's horrible what is happening there. And I'm sure that the, that the COVID is, is, is doing a, a very big impact as in the other countries in Latin America. But we don't know exactly what's going on there. So we hopefully uh, they, these guys are going to recover and take the, the lead of, of the democracy uh, as they have to. Per perfect. Uh, Beatriz Ayala um, from Musicasa asked, do you have projections for the next five to 10 years? Yes. Y yes, I might have. I'm not sure if I put it in this presentation, Beatriz, but I, I can send you, I will send to Dan a very good presentation about uh, uh, five to ten years projection about most of the internet economy in, in Latin America. A very nice document that it was released very maybe last week, and I think it has a projection that I can of course share with you, Beatriz. And what we're going to do uh, is we're going to share with you the folks who uh, participated today, so that you can actually send it to Beatriz directly if you wanted. Okay, perfect. Um, and that way that you, Beatriz can be in direct touch with you. Kevin Mather okay. asked, do you have data on cross-border B2C e-commerce? Not on this presentation, but I might have some. Uh, it's relatively small, uh, uh, cross-border. Maybe in Mexico, it is not as small as in the other countries. And the reason for that is because Mexico is very close from the U.S. So people, for instance, in general, the Mexicans are very likely to buy through Amazon from the U.S. and things like that. So, But it's been growing, and I'm sure that COVID accelerated that many, 10 or 20 times. Uh, I will try to find some information and make sure that you have it. I know there's a company in Argentina that has been doing some studies about cross-border, so I, I might have some information on that. Perfect. And then Wilson Guaraca asked, would love to hear about the access to capital in the region, venture capital, for instance, and any thoughts on how COVID is going to alter this? 
Fabulous. Uh, I have a presentation. I have some slides uh, at the end of this presentation about the opportunity and what's going on, which, by the way, COVID really has not really affected uh, the, the capital investment in Latin America, especially on the digital. Actually, uh, this year and last year have been the, 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 you know, we have received the largest amount of money coming from VCs, uh, especially from the U.S., uh, supporting all these uh, uh, digital uh, economy companies growing very fast in Latin America. Perfect. All right. So I want to make an agreement with you. I want to have so many questions myself. Um, <laughs> if we could maybe give another 10 or so minutes to your formal presentation. and then Absolutely. Jump into the Q&A, which frankly is my favorite part. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's, it's amazing to have this to share. So look, technology, I think the technology and the penetration, and this is where we see the, the biggest opportunity here is because Latin America uh, has a very uh, small investment uh, in technology. And this is the opportunity that we see because this has to change. Look India, look China, look the US and whatever is, is going to happen the same at some point in Latin America. It doesn't care if you are a big or a medium or a small business, but here is the opportunity. Any, any, any type of technology uh, uh, that you could think could be applied to Latin America and of course, could be a very important business. One important and very important thing uh, that you guys need to consider when you do business in Latin America is the importance of WhatsApp. And largest market for WhatsApp in the world is Brazil. 99% of penetration has a WhatsApp in Brazilian market, which is crazy. By the way, uh, remember that WhatsApp launched a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, 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 wired uh, uh, money money transfer system and they launched it like uh, three months ago and they test Brazil as the first market. So imagine the importance uh, for for Facebook, uh, uh, the business in Brazil in terms of WhatsApp. And remember that WhatsApp is going to help, especially the small businesses on how to connect people uh, with businesses. Very, very, very easy. Right now we see it in the, here in Latin America, for instance, in Colombia, if you want to order a pizza, you just go into a WhatsApp a pizza business and you just order, they send you a small link, you just click the link and put your credit card data and make the, make the transaction, it's pure online transaction and it's basically through WhatsApp and WhatsApp for business is very, very, very popular here in Latin America, by the way, so consider that if you guys uh, uh, think to do business, maybe it's a very easy and very cost efficient way to create an e-commerce here. Maybe you just need, or if you got a, a Salesforce, for instance, many companies that have large Salesforce in Latin America with the lockdowns, everyone is at home, but maybe right now everyone, all these Salesforce are doing sales using WhatsApp at home, attending all, the, all of the e-commerce uh, people that are um, maybe asking or trying to, to, to make uh, transactions uh, with some kind of support from an agent or from a sales guy, prospective guy. So this is very important, the WhatsApp business. Look, uh, uh, I think Maria, Beatriz asked about the, the next five to 10 years. I can show you the past five to 10 years what's happening in Brazil. And if you see, of course, Brazil e-commerce has been growing so fast. Uh, the, uh, if you consider, look, Brazil is maybe uh, the seventh or the sixth largest economy in e-commerce in the world uh, is half of what's happening in e-commerce in Latin America. And, and if you see, uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 Brazil is almost half of what's happening here in, in, in almost everything. In e-commerce is 50%, in credit card users is 57, in internet users is 65, mobile users 65. So Brazil is, is very big for us. Uh, of course, B2C, uh, which is the e-commerce, the, the, e uh, the business to consumer, uh, uh, is been growing so fast in the other countries, especially in Mexico. In Mexico, it started to grow dramatically since Amazon arrived three years ago. So the retail start to accelerate investment on, on, on e-commerce. And of course, the, the, the e-commerce group, fantastic, dramatically. And look what's happening in the e-commerce in the past years in Latin America. It represents a very good uh, opportunity. Uh, what happened in the, you know, in 10 weeks, which is the, the March 
uh, until maybe the end of April, uh, happened in the past 10 years. Uh, at some point uh, uh, in Brazil, it was a, a penetration, a huge penetration, not the same one that it happens in the U.S. I think the, the U.S. Uh, grew uh, uh, faster, according to what the McKinsey showed in one of the reports, but Brazil did really a big jump, especially in Latin America as well, did a big jump uh, in the e-commerce. Uh, in the in the coronavirus, by the way, it helped a lot. And on the other hand, we see also a very huge opportunity in the advertisement space. So digital advertisement will be very big. And the reason for that is that there's a still uh, a lot of room to grow. If you see the penetration or the share of attention compared to the share of budget, uh, the share of attention is the black uh, uh, column. And when, when you see digital, you see a black column. Uh, and then uh, a blue. The blue is the real investment and the black is the share of attention. And as you see, the share of attention is still far behind from the uh, budget. So it's expected uh, uh, that, the, that the share of budget or the investment uh, grows rapidly in order to be the same or very equal between the attention and the budget that is what's happening in the U.S. today. So digital advertisement is also a very in business in Latin America, especially uh, in mobile, uh, since I already told you that uh, almost all the internet right now in Latin America is moved through through cell phones. Uh, uh, also, uh, of course, uh, compared to other to other economies, Latin America is not as big as any as other economies. Maybe the total advertisement spending in Latin America this year will reach maybe $12 billion, which is relatively small compared to what's happening in the U.S. and in other economies, but it's still a very uh, good opportunity for that. There's also another opportunity here in Latin America uh, that I see is the people that really uh, produce content, maybe smaller producers that would like to penetrate Spanish speaking in uh, uh, Latin America is one of the key markets. If you see, for instance, the case of Netflix, I don't know if you are aware of this, but Netflix decided to come to penetrate Latin America uh, 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 first before they went to other countries. And the reason for that is that they discovered that Latins are crazy about consuming uh, this type of, of solutions like the, you know, like the, the OTTs or the Netflix or the Prime Videos or et cetera. And the same for TikTok. TikTok has been growing dramatically in all Latin America. So uh, this is a very important uh, uh, point or topic that uh, content is very important, especially in video, is, is very popular here in, in Latin America. So the future in Latin America, as I mentioned before, is totally digital tech penetration. It's a very important tech adoption, a lifeline during the pandemic. Of course, the pandemic accelerated this very fast. And of course, everybody's thinking on how to build the path uh, for digital. And regarding the VC opportunity, if you see Latin America, look what happened in 2019. Uh, it's, it's almost a record uh, in the money that the VC investments in Latin America, and especially uh, in, in, in Brazil, where maybe 60% of that money uh, went to that. Look, uh, uh, right now, for instance, the, start, the startup booming. And this is a ranking that, they, that these guys uh, built. Uh, uh, Sao Paulo is the 12th country, 12th city uh, to to start a startup or a digital startup in in, in that. Uh, there's also a very important point, and here in Latin America, Apple is almost doesn't exist. Uh, maybe 88, 90 percent of the penetration of the smartphones is coming from from Android. So this is very important also to consider, uh, which is kind of unique uh, compared maybe to India or maybe to Africa, but it's not the case in, in other economies where iOS has a very large uh, penetration. So that's something that, that, that you guys need to, con to consider as well. Uh, and commerce, as I mentioned before, is also becoming very relevant. And the reason for that is that the huge penetration of smartphones and the people that are very... Uh, Younger people, you know, are more likely to use cell phones and Latin, uh, Latin America, it's uh, mostly young people and, of course, uh, relatively poor people. Maybe 
the smartphones are the only source of connecting to the internet, by the way. So this is, of course, something that is going to grow or explode the e-commerce in the next coming of years. Uh, also, the mobile payments, uh, which is happening right now, the fintechs that are moving Latin America, I think, are are reshaping what we know about the financial or the banking industry. And it's happening right now in a very big uh, uh, effort in most of the countries and in part because of the coronavirus and, and, and is helping a lot to, to penetrate all these the, all these all these uh, uh, fintechs 2022 looks great but the opportunity is today as i mentioned before if you compare latin with china and india just like um, to to make a small recap uh, latin america is among the most promising markets and the opportunity is right now for you uh, uh, if you see or if you consider latin by 2050 you will see of course that latin america will remain on top it was going, going to be very big by the way uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, we always think that doing business in LATAM is hard, is difficult, uh, but India and China are more difficult, are harder to do. And the reason for that is that uh, in Latin America, if you see there are 32 countries, which is 32 realities, almost 32 languages, we call it everything in Spanish, but at the end of the day, it's not the same language. Uh, uh, it's, uh, 32 different laws. 32 different regulations, 32 different countries. So you need to treat it as a different country, each one. So sometimes that's why many companies uh, think that in get or enter into LATAM represents a, a trouble. Uh, the ones that really understand that Latin America is not equal. For instance, I was telling uh, uh, some clients at New York, with Andrew, which is here in this presentation, that uh, in Latin America, uh, Venezuela used to be very big uh, consuming one brand of toothpaste, while Colombia, which is in the border, it has the opposite to the toothpaste brand as a leader. So things totally in the opposite, and uh, 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 with countries like very looks that in general looks very similar, but have totally different uh, behaviors in terms of consumption. So that's very important. For instance, uh, 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 people in Latin America. We like to drink liquors, but uh, not every country likes hard liquor, for instance. And, and we, we drink different liquors in some points at different hours. If you see the Mexicans are more in the hard liquor, but if you see in Central America and the Caribbean, they love more or the rum or the beer. And if you see in the South of Latin America with the Southern corn, they prefer the wine. And if you go to to Brazil, maybe it's totally mixed um, between beer and wine and hard liquor. So it's not the same. So if you are a brand, you cannot consider Latin America as one country. You need to understand that it's a different cultures and different everything in order to set up a, a business. Uh, also, Latin America uh, is not an easy in terms of the, the way to do business. Uh, if you see Brazil is 120 <laughs> country, uh, most difficult to do business in this 142. Argentina is 124, Mexico is 39, which is pretty good. Chile is 41, and Colombia, I think, is 57, if I don't, if I don't. And just to mention, and I'm, it's almost uh, the, the presentation is going to finish in a couple of slides, uh, we also have uh, some unicorns, uh, very big, that operate here in Latin America with very big uh, uh, market caps. And, and there's another... Uh, um, very important uh, uh, tip for all of you, for the ones that are looking at Brazil as a potential and think always that Brazil has a, a very play locally. And that's one of the recommendations that everybody does is if you go to Brazil, try to speak in Portuguese, try to invoice locally, try to maybe to partner someone locally, try to, to, to go the local as you can in order to guarantee that the business is going to flow of course, uh, 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 correctly. And on the other hand, of course, the other hand of the Latinos here in Latin America is the U.S. Hispanic market, which is, by the way, another big and huge market. And I'm going to provide you a very quick uh, 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 show, an overview, two or three slides about what's going on with the U.S. Hispanics in the U.S., which I think is one of the most biggest opportunities that everyone has in the U.S., if you see the U.S. Latino market, is the GDP is growing at 8.6%, faster than China and India. Uh, the economy is, or was, 
2.6 trillion in 2018 and all up almost 9% uh, uh, compared to 2017. Uh, there are 2.5 Latinos for every Asian American in college. If the US Latino market was its own country, it would be the eighth largest economy in the world, which is a very important uh, methodology. Or on the other hand, the, it, it would be the largest Latino market in the world. It would be larger than Brazil and twice the size of Mexico in terms of GDP, which is very important. The economy and the impact of the economy, the U.S. economy, because of the Latino, is very important. Um, uh, this is a very quick uh, snapshot about what's going on. Uh, there's another important thing about the Hispanics in the U.S., and they are over-indexed in the way uh, they use the cell phones. So if you want to reach Latinos, maybe the cell phones, the smartphones, is one of the uh, more smart and easiest way to reach them massively uh, because of the everyone has a smartphone and the use for the use of the smartphones are is it's is very is very big. If you see here in this graph, in the you see that Hispanics of course use internet much and the penetration and the usage is higher than the non-Hispanics. So this is also a very important methodology. Uh, uh, and if you see what's going on with the population, which I think is very important, is that population is still growing. And by the way, it's going to be very big by maybe 2035. It's going to reach almost uh, 100 million people. Uh, right now, it's almost 20% of the total population in the U.S., which I think is a very important uh, number for the for the Hispanics. And by California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Arizona, and the largest DMAs for, for them which makes them the, the most important ones. And another, another important uh, uh, topic to talk is, is about, you know, the, how young is the Latins or the U.S. Latin, uh, the U.S. Hispanics, which is uh, Latinos are the youngest population. So it's very important. Millennials are uh, very big in terms of uh, for, for the U.S. Hispanics versus non-Hispanics. Non and... This is all what I have for today. I'm going to stop sharing my presentation to become maybe to the, to the questions that, that you guys want to, to talk. Perfect. Um, so one of the questions is from Beatriz. Um, she asked about um, money transfer platforms like PayPal or Venmo, and do they vary by country? Yes, uh, and uh, in the past, Beatrice, uh, and very nice question because uh, I think, and I, I think I, I was looking at the number of money or the amount of money that I was is transferred almost every year. I think it's almost fifty billion dollars in transfers between the U.S. through Latin America. It's, it's, it's huge. The business is huge, and mostly is Mexico. I think is the largest country. Uh, then is Colombia, uh, Ecuador is also very big, Peru, and Central American countries, which makes sense with the population in the U.S., but it's a huge business. And uh, the, in terms of platforms that you see, of course, Western Union used to be the leader, uh, and I think it still uh, has a very big portion of the, of the business today, but uh, this business has to be transformed by PayPal and everything. The thing with PayPal here in Latin America is that PayPal has not been able to get license for transferring money in most of the countries. So uh, I think it's a matter of regulation, but it's uh, not letting those those new players or new economy players to penetrate really hard, like Vimo and all these uh, uh, apps that you see in the US. Those are not really popular here in Latin America. Latin America, I think the banks and the smaller, like the Western unions, and there are all a, like more, more like a bank, more, more like a financial institutions, those are the ones that are right now transferring the money. But that's a very good question because I really see a very important and a very important opportunity on that on that point. So, um, Carlos, just wanted to let you know I'm not we're not going to have time to talk about the cannabis industry, um, but I do appreciate your question and perhaps um, if there's some information, Alberto, that you have to follow up with him on on that. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a lot of there's a lot of noise about it, especially here in Colombia. Uh, but I have uh, some documentation about it. Of course, I can send it to Carlos. Perfect. I wanted to talk about Rapi for a sec. Uh, Rapi is a um, 
kind of the WeChat of Latin America increasingly. It's a uniform Latin American payment platform. Uh, I actually was meeting yesterday with the head of Latin American payments for Spotify. And he talked about one of the huge challenges uh, of being able to penetrate the Latin American market is the very different ways in which each country conducts commerce. In fact, many folks pay for their Spotify subscriptions at kioscos with cash. Yep, right. And Rappi is a messaging platform that has incorporated almost like debit card-like functionality. Um, and it is uh, increasingly becoming popular across the region, helping solve this unbanked issue. And frankly, uh, putting Latin America in some ways, like China is ahead of the United States in terms of what I think is the next wave of digital um, Absolutely. acclimation. Dan, what, what is happening is that uh, Rappi, by the way, is, it's, they, they claim to be the first super app in Latin America. And I'm going to explain to you exactly. Super app is like WeChat, which is a, 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 an app that you have many of services just only on one app. So you have e-commerce, you have payments, you have a chat, you have almost everything entertainment uh, so you got your own netflix you got your own zoom you got your own e-commerce you got amazon your own uh, uh, paypal it, it, that's what they call the the super app and they want they think that model which works very 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 good in asia it will work dramatically well in latin america uh, uh, rapi uh, when rapi arrived and by the way it's a colombian company when they launched they launched as the last mile e-commerce company and that's exactly what they what, what they were doing they were doing the last mile which is the delivery and they basically uh, broke i'm going to say broke the record of delivery in, in terms of timing because if you see amazon claims to to deliver in the us in two hours in maybe in, in one hour or rapi delivers to you whatever in 20 minutes so it's 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 an incredible things so you just you just have the app maybe you need a dolex or maybe you just want a beer and maybe you ask for a beer and they just br bring it to you in 10 minutes and it's still cold the beer. You can still have a cold beer. You know what I mean? So those are the things that those guys are changing using people using bikes, not motorcycles, bikes. So th that's incredible. So, and, and they also uh, develop a payment gateway, which is a new wallet that they are trying, of course, to, to it's an app for payment. So they want to, 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 to become of also a, a financial player in the region. But I think uh, 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 Mercado Libre, which is the eBay in Latin America, uh, uh, has a, another payment system. They call it Mercado Pago, which is a, a scan code. It's kind of a barcode uh, for payments, uh, touchless and everything. And I believe is the, today is the largest uh, player on the on the on the on the new payments methods in Latin America but still it's a very uh, important uh, and very big opportunity not also for rapi but also for the competitors there there's maybe another competitor in Brazil for rapi named iFood very big i think is 10 times larger than rapi in Brazil um, and, and rapi is very big and on the other hand we see the other last mile player which is uber eats remember that uber eats in Latin America became a, 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 a mobility player. They partnership the restaurants and they deliver it to you. They, they became the last miler using the cars and all, of course, the technology. And they also develop a payment gateway with the, the Uber payments or whatever they call it. And, and it's pretty popular, especially in Mexico. Um, we have uh, one more question from the audience that I wanted to ask. And then I have, uh, I'm going to end with a question about the election. Uh, okay. since I know you guys do work there. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a great question from Kevin Mather, who unfortunately left the, the, the chat, but it's still a good question. Where do you think are the opportunities in the Latin American region for U.S.-based small and medium-sized businesses? So if you're a small business in the U.S. and you're interested in doing business in Latin America, where do you think are the best opportunities? Whether I it's say, I, I will start in Central America or in Colombia, because we, I mean Colombia is a nice size and it's pretty competitive and pretty open. But Central America is developed, so maybe you can test 
or maybe you just because in Latin America you need to make some adapt you need to adapt the product that you have in the US then to be to 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 play in in the, in Latin in Latin America so maybe you just can start doing a, a soft launch in maybe in Central America Central America by the way is very very connected to the US so I think it's very 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 likely to do it when you have something maybe more mature. Uh, Mexico is the is the country that you should go. Mexico, Colombia, and Central America. I would say, uh, and it used to be Venezuela because Venezuela used to be very big. If you wanna play hard, go to Brazil. But you have to think differently, and and of course, uh, maybe try to play more locally than 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 or than than a foreign company. But I would say uh, the answer for Kevin is Central America, maybe Guatemala, or maybe Costa Rica. Which Guatemala is the largest in population and 14 million, I think, is and uh, Costa Rica is far smaller, maybe four or five million. But uh, but you can test the product there. You just can do you know the 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 fine tuning of your product and then just move to Mexico, which is largest or Colombia. Peru is also a nice country to do business. So my question is, I I know from having spoken to Andrew uh, that your business has grown this year despite. The massive economic fallout, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is uh, the presidential election, and uh, a number of um, political uh, players on both sides of the aisle have leveraged AdsMobile to help uh, grow their reach of U.S. Hispanics. The other is the um, Black Lives Matter movement, and interestingly, that has raised awareness of the importance of targeting specific underrepresented demographics, including brown folk, um, including Hispanics, if you will. And so uh, I'd love you to just address those two points. What are you seeing from your vantage point at AdsMobile, both in terms of election targeting of US Hispanics and also of um, brands and corporations targeting of US Hispanics and Latin Americans? So the, the first thing that I want to let you know is that the Hispanics that lives in the U.S. are totally different than the Hispanics that lives in Latin America. That's very also very important for everyone to know. The Mexican living in the U.S. is not the same Mexican living in Mexico. So that's that's the most important thing to understand. Okay, uh, uh, and and regarding your question, I w- I'm going to start with the second one, which is the uh, about the brands. Uh, the, general the, the brands trying to target latinos and i think uh, because of the big population of latinos and the different way that the latinos behave especially you know the the mother or the women is the owner of the of the home and they decided most of the things that they buy which happens exactly the same in latin america as as the hispanics in the u.s uh, uh, of course the companies need to understand the best way to communicate with those those uh, segments let's say and uh, language is something that is very important for Latinos. Uh, maybe for, if you see, maybe Latinos are uh, described as first generation, the ones that just recently arrived to the US. The second generation Latinos are the ones that maybe arrived at some point with their parents and their parents are uh, not from the US, but maybe they just got, uh, for whatever the reason, or they born in the US, or maybe they just became, uh, 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 they got the, the, the green card or whatever in the process. They call it second generation and third generation is where your grandfather uh, used to be Latino. Uh, I think the opportunities in Latinos first second generation where the where the Spanish language is very strong on their the ADN uh, everyone. So maybe for instance, first generation they don't speak English or a little English, so everything is almost in Spanish. Second generation Latinos, may, especially in the younger population, millennials, they do all the social activity in English. I mean, they just go to school and speak English as everyone. Uh, and by the, when they go home, they speak Spanish, and they listen to Spanish music and they sing in Spanish and they maybe watch soccer. And when they go to soccer, they also go back to their old roots and maybe with the food some. The family, food, and soccer are maybe the most important, and, and music are the, 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 the things that are really tied to, to their roots. So uh, uh, the brands know that, they, they all know that the Latinos behave that way, so they are trying to, to get ways to, to communicate. They also know that the, 
uh, Latinos over index in smartphones, so they prefer to connect with them in smartphones than maybe other platforms. That's, of course, uh, something very important. And I think what happened in the U.S. because of the Black Lives Matter and everything is that there is a, a resurrection of the Hispanic uh, um, um, opportunity in the U.S. I think when the current president arrived, uh, all the Latino community, all the efforts from the big companies or the American corporations uh, 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 doing efforts to communicate their way with Latinos, all the, they backed a little bit uh, uh, because they were afraid that, that the current president w w was going to take action on that. Remember that the day uh, the current president said, he said, no, we're, I'm going to ask for to close all the shut down all the plants in Mexico and everyone wants to buy the trucks here in the U.S. and blah, blah, blah. You know, those kind of things that, of course, everyone started. We don't know if we need to target very openly or to communicate very openly to Hispanics because we don't want any problem with the government. Of course not. But everything is changing. And I think right now everyone needs to understand that, that there is a big opportunity. And, of course, that the largest minority is the Latino. So if you want to target minor minorities, Latinos are, by the way, the 80% of the minorities in the U.S. So that's the, the second question. The first one, which is coming to the elections, definitely because of what's happening right now, and it's been happening in the past three elections, is that the key states are, are very important. The, the population of Latinos have, it's, it's, it's very big. So at the end of the day, Latinos are very uh, important in the key decision markets for what's going on. Look what's happening right now in Florida, which who will ever uh, imagine that Florida was going to be the key, the, the key uh, uh, state to maybe to define the elections. And the Colombians, the Colombian population, look what's happening in the past two weeks. Uh, Trump have never, I mean, no one in the elections before have talked about Colombia. I mean, no one. That's not the topic. I think you guys need to talk about your topics, but he's going after the Colombian votes, the voters, which, which is Fair enough, and of course, the other, Biden is going to do the same, and everyone is going to try to, to come uh, after the, the, the Latinos. And I think this year, uh, uh, the number or the amount of money behind the elections, behind the Latinos, is, is going to set up a record uh, for the Spanish-speaking Latinos. Because I think Latinos, uh, I think it's 35 million, 32 million possible voters. It's, it's a lot of voters, uh, potential voters in the U.S. And uh, of course, uh, they will make the difference this year and who's going to be the, the next president of the United States. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for the time, the amazing insights. Uh, very, very much appreciate it. We're going to be sharing these slides with all the amazing data and uh, Alberto and his team, Banano and his team are also going to be following up individually with several of you who had specific requests of data that he can then provide. Um, with that, I wanted to uh, quickly just uh, talk about uh, what we have coming up again uh, in BizHack Live, and then we'll uh, say goodbye and, and thanks for sticking around uh, a little bit extra. So uh, coming up, uh, as I said, in BizHack Live, whoops, is... I don't know. Oh, there you are. Um, coming up in BizHack Live is um, is going to be our graduation party next Wednesday. The five pillars of digital campaigns, a holiday marketing roundtable in partnership with Ikaba. Can anybody hear me? Getting heard in an overcrowded world. The seven keys to exponential marketing. Free tools to find your ideal customer online with Emerge Americas. Just an amazing lineup. Uh, I'm so grateful to you guys for uh, being here today. Feel free to sign up for our season pass if you'd like to learn more. And, and most importantly, I just want to end with this note. Uh, we are in a crisis, uh, a political crisis, a cultural crisis, obviously a health crisis. Inside of crisis is danger and opportunity, and we're here to help you grasp that opportunity. Please come back and join us again next week for BizHack Live. And with that, I say thanks a lot. Thanks all to joining us today.